In 1960, the average man weighed 166 pounds. Today, the average height of a male in 1960. Hang on, if you had something interesting, why did you hold out to the middle of the episode? The average amount of garbage per day produced per person. Here we have some stern words. There they have diseased organs. But you can't physically do it. Ooh la la, ooh la la. That is the wonderful melodious sound that leads us into a new episode of Smart Dribble with your co-host Kurt Schneider and... Your other co-host John Ellenthal is ooh la la French, Kurt? Mais oui, monsieur. It could be anything, but it has a French overtone and undertone. You know that when you speak French, I immediately am transported back to one of our very first episodes joy of sandwiches where we discussed our favorite sandwiches and you introduce the croque monsieur and the croque madame and i learned from you that the difference was the croque madame i believe has an egg on top oh yeah baby oh yeah so ooh la la takes me right to an egg on top you know i'm hoping that we can start traveling again because it's time to get back to france well I hope that you get to go back to France, too, because you talk a lot about French things. I recall your discussions of uh, sweet and savory crepes as well. How about when I talked about Lafayette and how amazing he was for us during the because I think I wanted him at the dinner party, how amazing he was at the American Revolution and how he traded everything in his life to come over and help Washington and was incredible and did everything for us and got France into the war, which helped us win. And then we with General Pershing in World War I, when we landed on the French shores, what did we say? He said, Lafayette, we are here because we promised, since he did us such a solid during the Revolutionary War, that we would reciprocate when it was time to fight for French independence. And while we are here is good, the fact that we were so many decades late, not so good. A couple hundred years, yeah, 150 years, maybe, yeah, 140. Yeah, there was French, was that 1787, the French Revolution? 1789, good try, John. 1789. was when the Constitution was ratified. Yes, I think part of what confused me was I got my license on July 14th, 1981, Bastille Day. Yes. So we have a strong French connection, having nothing to do at all with Gene Hackman. No, which was a great movie. I could drink some Sancerre and watch The French Connection. Suddenly, I feel like sprinkling herbs de Provence on my food. In any event, this episode, believe it or not, is nothing nothing to to do do with with France. France. (laughs) Not even a little bit to do with France. Instead, we are going to put some hard facts and figures around our common reminiscing about how life in the 60s is different than life today. We're going to talk about the differences between the average person in the 1960s and the average person now across a whole host of categories. Nothing says smart drivel more than hard facts and stats, because that's what we go by. Would you like me to go first, Kurt? Yeah, by the way, just take it easy on me, because the last time I took math was 1982. You're going to now give me some stats different. Give me one. The American average person, 1960 versus now, what? What's the difference? I think we're the exact same. We look the same. We act the same. We are the same. Well, I think the interesting thing is it's only been 60 years and evolutionary biology doesn't really move that fast. So 60 years is completely irrelevant from an evolutionary standpoint. That being said, there are some physical changes to the average American body in that short period of time that are rather staggering. Allow me to stagger you with this. In 1960, Kurt, the average man weighed 166 pounds. Today, 100, and wait for it, 94 pounds. We have gained 28 pounds on average to the male body in 60 years. That is insane. 
So do you think 194, I can't wrap my head around that because- You can't wrap your head around, why don't you go wrap your head around a mirror and you'll see what 194 looks like. Wow, I'm less (laughs) than that. I'm the same (laughs) weight since 1985 when I dropped my football weight from the last time I played football, same weight since then. Are you really the same weight as you were in 1985? Yeah, and guess what that weight is? 185, no coincidence. Well, that is a that is a very healthy weight. May I ask you your waist? 34. That's excellent news because I had a well-known cardiologist once tell me that of all the stats out there that are predictive of heart health and the risk of heart attack, that the dividing line between men who go on to have serious heart issues and men who do not is a waist of 34. So you are in good shape, my friend. Okay, I fall on the right side of it. Now, you and I are different in very few ways, Kurt. Very few ways. In 1985, I was the personification of the beam pole. 140 so pounds. I was probably 150 something pounds, give or take. I have gained more weight. <laughs> in the ensuing years than the average American male has gained since the 1960s. So I too am in the 180s, but I'm coming from 150. So getting back to the 194, you said, yeah. so is that, do we think average versus median, right? I always under, misunderstood those things, but is the average 194 because we have a ton more of mighty obese people? Like we didn't have, we had three people over 300 in 1960. We now have 95 people over 300. Those are the hard facts and figures we were talking about earlier, the ones you just made up. (laughs) Well, the question is, is that what's happening? Is it like the very few are tipping the scales? Well, literally. I suspect not. And I will give you my personal theory in a moment, but let me share with you first how the average female body has changed since the 1960s. The average woman in 1960 weighed 140 pounds. Today, that number is 164 pounds. Also a number in the mid-20s, like the men. Wow. So I think there are a lot of factors because you can't explain a transformation that profound, dramatic, and brief. You can't have a change of this magnitude and speed and have it just be attributable to a single factor. But I don't think there's any question that what we put in our mouths to eat has got to be the single biggest factor. Our per capita caloric consumption, as well as the chemicals and steroids that are used to grow our food, clearly are having an impact on our average size. There are other factors as well. I suspect we're much more sedentary than we were back then. Sitting is the new smoking kind of thing. But do you have a theory? No, but what I'm interested in is I think you're probably right. I would not have thought that until I did some research myself because I thought, okay, huh, men are going from 166 to 194. Well, I watch football. I watch the NBA. I watch the NFL. These people are huge. The, the average NFL player is so much bigger than he was back then. Right. And with the NBA players. So I thought maybe humans are just rapidly. It's like the tail end of a, of a curve that goes up crazy up where it might be a tiny bit in the evolutionary scale. But we're cranking forward because food is more nutritious. We work out more. We're more scientific. We wear Fitbits. We have all these things. So we are taller and larger. And then I read the, new, the fact and I was wrong. And you're probably right. The average height of a male in 1960, five foot eight, okay. right? Kind of get that, right? Coming out of the fifties where they did the jitterbug, which compressed their spine. So made them shorter. So five foot eight now, yeah. Five foot nine, only one inch. So only an inch high, but gazillion pounds wide. Ain't yes. good. More girth, not as much height. I suspect we're actually not even taller. I think that we probably have gained an inch on average back when the disco craze was going on and everyone was wearing platform shoes. I suspect hair. we're the exact same height, Mr. Hair. Travolta. Hair. Hair. It could be hair as well. Yeah. I think that's kind of crazy, Kurt. We are so much bigger. Portion okay. size. Okay. So I found something interesting that that actually is very 
relatable to Hang that. on. If you had something interesting, why did you hold out to the middle of the episode? Because it fits with this larger... Relevant matter. and interesting? Yeah. You got to lead the show with stuff like that, Kurt. Tell me what you think the in pounds, the average amount of garbage per day produced per person was in 1960. Okay. How many pounds of garbage each person produced? So I don't have any doubt that it's higher now, but I would say a few pounds. So let's say like three to five pounds in the 60s per person. You'd be very close. 2.68. Not Hey, a do I know my garbage, Kurt, or what? And I'm guessing is they were using farm to table stuff, right? They were not using processed this and that. There wasn't as much plastic. Okay. Yeah. Guess what it is today. Got to be much higher because today, you know, everything is disposable, single serving size. There's all of this packing material. We do takeout now. We didn't do takeout back then. Right. There's a much more takeout, especially during the pandemic. But I think there's a lot of individual serving sizes of stuff. And I think there's, you know, so what is it? I would say it's double. Close. 4.48. So almost double. I am like, who was the character in Sesame Street who lived in the garbage? Was that Oscar? Yeah. I am like the garbage man today. That was always the good job to get for summer job. You know why? Because you were done early in the day. How did you know? It's exactly right. Here's the bad part of the job. You have to get up freakishly early and you have to handle garbage for several hours. And on a hot summer day, that's got to smell like hot garbage. Yeah. So I didn't do that, but I mowed lawns all day around all the schools in the town I grew up in. I used to get up at like four in the morning, and mow all the lawns so that I could be done when my friends who work on the garbage crew were done. <laughs> the only difference was I didn't smell like garbage. You talk about a sedentary life. I a sedentary think, life. Yeah. I think I'd love to do this. Okay. Maybe, maybe we can do this for another episode. What were people like when we were an agrarian society? Oh, yeah. Then the difference to a industrial society and now to a technical society or a metaverse society. I wonder the impact, besides us being far more sallow faced and pale and fleshy, I think we're not intrinsically, naturally, organically strong because we're not getting anything. We just sit in front of our computer. Yeah, I think I'm still stunned by your use of the metaverse economy. So you are clearly ripped from the headlines here today. Bleeding, baby, bleeding edge. You know what? It is not a mistake that you are the executive chairman of a technology company. And is your technology company exploring the metaverse? Heck yeah, we are. And everything that comes with it. Heck yeah, we are. So. By the way, I just read today that there's a guy who is president of a metaverse real estate company. He's trying to sell virtual real estate. Oh, no, it's a thing. A plot of virtual land in the metaverse just sold last week for a humongous amount of money. You and I need to figure this out because, because it's otherwise confusing. Sedentary, there's no question that when we were an agrarian economy, we were on our feet and doing physical things all the time. Now that our economy is more driven by our brains than our physical labor, sort of our mental labor versus our physical labor, we sit on our asses a lot more than we used to. And look at kids. When you and I were kids, after school, we'd go out with our friends on our bikes running around. And now, you know, all the kids' activities are so structured. And more importantly, there are screens everywhere. Our screen time difference between then and now must be through the freaking roof. So because of these screens and because of the nature of our work, we do not move like we used to move. Although you still got the moves, Kurt. Yeah, but, and you're right about our kids. What we would do, and I'm not waxing poetic about our youth, but I'm kind of waxing poetic about our youth. You come back from school when you're in elementary school or junior high, and now they call it middle school, we call it junior high. Right. And you played out in the street until your mom called you for dinner. Right. Even when we were in industrial society, when you're agrarian, you're working seven days a week. Right. Industrial, you're working six days a week. But you're on your not feet too. You're not sitting at a desk. That's what I'm saying. That I should have let you say that then. Well, it's a segue from pure on it to industrial. You're working in that factory. You're pulling stuff and pushing stuff six days a week. Yeah. There's no leisure. Then all of a sudden we get leisure time in the 50s. And now we have far more leisure time because we've gone from agrarian to industrial to technical. 
And it's interesting. We now manufacture. Don't you think our forefathers are laughing at us that we go into a gym and pay for someone to mimic what they did naturally? So lifting the plow and lifting a weight and pretending you're chopping wood. So have you ever called the word leisure, leisure? Because I really dislike that. Oh, it's so fun. That's why the Brits say it. It's at your leisure. I know, but when you're an American and you say it, you sound really pretentious. Now, maybe you have a gin martini in one hand with your pinky out and you're wearing like some white suit, but it's, it's not leisure, Kurt. I also say dysentery instead of dysentery. Charming. It's because my friend who I worked with at Fox, who was British, when she was working at Star TV in Hong Kong, she got dysentery or in India, in India. So here's another contributor, another difference between then and now, the average person that I think also contributes to our bigger body volume. So we talked about food and we talked about our lack of movement, relatively speaking. Kurt, the average age of somebody in 1960 in this country, 20 nueve. Did you take elementary school Spanish, Kurt? I'm fluent in Spanish, John. 29. So 29 is correct. And today, the average age is different. Would you like to throw a guess out? It's older. <laughs> 35. Very good guess, Kurt. Close. The average age today is 37. So we are an older society. Sociologists okay. might suggest that we are, quote unquote, de-youthing, which clearly is a reflection of the fact you don't like the de-youthing. Sounds like euthanize. Which I'm sorry, but I think it's, you know, one of those academic words, de-youthing, which makes sense because younger people today are less interested in getting married and having a bunch of kids at such an early age like previous generations. I think the number of children per household is down and those kids are being born later and later. So that is creating a heavier concentration of older people. So I think you're right, but I think it's skewed, just like I think all those 300 plus pounders skewed the weight thing. Skewed? Because there's, been a, there's clearly been less skewing if we're not having more kids. <laughs> it's skewing younger back then because of one phenomenon that was a once in a lifetime phenomenon, the baby boom after World War II, right? Baby boom started in 1946. By 1960, when you gave me that fact, there's a shitload of kids under 14. Right. But I, I, but I still think there's a bigger trend at work that me too. If you, you go back further and further and people were having more and more kids at younger ages. So well, you needed it for the agrarian society because you needed yeah. to have for, fit the farm. Plus, people were dying. All the kids died all the time. Have you ever heard the baby boom? Do you think it makes a noise? No, that's the echo boom. Boom, 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 boom. So now I've heard the echo boom, but I've never heard the baby boom. Yeah. Let's be very subtle. So we are decidedly older. So let's not get negative here. We basically have pointed out. I did read and you brought it up, but I did read the other day that this Gen Z, they don't want kids. Now that some of them will have it, but they don't want them. And fewer people are getting married anyway. It is. You know what? Guess what? I think it's good. More food for the rest of us. Well, that's fine. And I, I think while there's not an absolute relationship between marriage and having children, there is a relationship. Correct. So in 1960, 72% of adults were married. That's a lot. That's like almost three quarters. Today, wow. only 51% are married. So we are getting married a lot less than we used to. So can I ask you a question? Yeah. Are we getting married a lot less or was the phenomenon that kicked in the 70s that's gotten even larger here as people get divorced? So maybe they're still getting married, but they're getting divorced. I wonder what the divorce rate was in 1960 versus now. And we should overlay those. I'm a big, Good question. I'm a big connections guy, John. I think the reality is independent of the divorce rate, which would be interesting that you took 100 people back in 1960, 100 adults and said, how many of you are married? 72 said yes. Today, you ask 100 whether they were divorced or remarried or whatever, 51 say yes. So I get marriage it. is less popular. Religion is less popular. And on the good news side, tell me about another American habit that is less popular than it was back in the 60s that goes into the giant good news bucket. It's, you know, that 
Charlie Connerly, the quarterback for the Giants in the 50s. And he was at the greatest game, which was a game they played against the Colts, which they lost because Don Amici scored in overtime. And Gino Capaletti broke his leg and kept playing. But anyway, you digress. Charlie Connerly was the first Marlboro man. Right. People are smoking a lot less. Cigarettes, that is. I know the, the weed consumption is way up, but they're not only smoking that, they are doing everything else with it. Lots but, of delivery pathways. Yes, exactly. But cigarettes, way down. I think we're gone from 50% of men to like 20% of men. What's amazing in some ways is that 20% of the population still smokes now that there's incontrovertible evidence that it kills you. Anyway, Kurt, have you ever seen a pack of cigarettes sold in another country? Yes, crazy. What can you tell me that's different about it? In the U.S., we have these (laughs) text-based warnings, hey, smoking can kill you. But what do they have in foreign countries? First of all, they're not just words. They're huge. It's all over the pack of cigarettes. And they're showing pictures. and They're saying this can happen to you. I think I saw one which was a picture of the person smoking through their neck. The stoma. This will happen to you. Yeah. Yeah. So here we have some stern words. There they have diseased organs on the package. That's probably more persuasive than a bunch of words, but I don't know. But the irony is, actually, where do people smoke more? In Europe and in South America and in Asia than they do in America. I like irony. So it's not working. It's forbidden fruit getting you. I want to come back to something you mentioned before. We were talking about, and we do have to wrap up soon, but there is something about screen time you mentioned. And we talked about this metaverse society we now live in. We live online with our NFTs and our cyber currency and our blockchain and our everything else, our fantasy and our candy crush and all these other things, our Instagram. Okay, you get it. Average time watching TV in the 60s, 1960. Give me hours a day, 1960. Well, it was probably still several hours because it was such a novelty and it was it was kind of a big improvement over the radio. So I would say, I don't know, three, four hours back in the 60s. Fiverr. You're very close. So you're guessing well today. Five hours a day. Now, I'm not going to tell you what TV watching is today, which I'm sure is a shitload, but I'm going to blow your mind even more. Let's talk about screens and screen. Time. Again, I'm going to go double because there are screens. I mean, the per capita screens, you probably have three to four screens per capita. And I scream at the screen who screens at my screams. Which screen do you scream at the most? The ones that screens my screams. You know, in space, no one can hear you scream. Ah, space balls. I think it was alien. Oh, 11 hours and 54 oh, shit. minutes per day. You know what, Kurt? It's not an official episode unless a gin martini was mentioned, which it has been. And what else? You utter the phrase. That's the problem with society today? Yes. This is the perfect time for you to whip out your favorite sentence opening fragment. Well, I think the problem with society is that we're not at least enjoying or seeing the opposite side of technological advances, right? Here's a technological advance, the wonderful spray coating of flavor on Doritos and Cheetos. That's a technological advance, but that's a beauty, but there's also a downside. It makes us fatter. So take the bad with the good, live, be present, be now, be who you are. Life is live, John. Kurt, be where your feet are, man. Yeah, man. I have good news for you. Present. Yeah. I have good news for you. As we wrap this up, I have an announcement to make to you and all of our listeners that that I am currently bidding for some waterfront property in the metaverse for our Smart Dribble Media Studios. What what do we do there? Do we just... I think in the metaverse, you do whatever you want. But you can't physically do it. Well, I guess in the metaverse, how big you, how much you weigh doesn't matter either. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go anti-metaverse and I'm going to go real. I want to shake hands. I want to hug. I want to see you laugh. I want to see you cry. I want to see you be aghast at what I say. I want to hear you burp. I want to see you do all this, but I don't want to see it on a screen. I want it live. I want to connect because I just want to, I want to go right in your eyes. Boom. With I want to point out with virtual reality, you may be able to experience a hug with the same sensations that you might in your version of real life. Why don't you start the antiverse I'm and you can sell to... space in the antiverse? How do you prevent someone from poking your eyes out? You wear glasses and you're on alert. 
if you were the three stooges, how would you do it? Because they taught us. You'd spray them with seltzer. No, you take your hand and you put it right in between your eyes and therefore the fingers can't get there. That's three stooges, man. All right, and with that lesson, that life lesson from yeah. the three stooges. Maybe someone tries to poke your eyes out. I'm with you. Listen, not only will, so I will be, my eyes will be safer going forward as will the eyes of our listeners. Right now, I'm concerned about the ears of our listeners because it is time for us to say goodbye to this week's episode. Kurt and I will be back next week with a brand new episode of Smart Dribble. Until then, we hope your week is filled with Smart Dribble. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Ciao.